Um, I'm I'm Tamara Ledley, and we'll be uh, facilitating our call today, our discussion. Um, before we get into discussing the various conferences this fall, um, I wanted to ask if there was any announcements. And if anybody wants to introduce themselves, um, please use the chat to do that. Jim? Sure. Thank you, Tamara. Um, so I'm going to announce three things as quickly as I can. But I want to just say that when I first encountered clean, you know, back when we were all starting this, um, the big word that I always got from Noah was scalability. That was the big thing. We want to be scalable. And I think that often is a thing of the number of educators that can be reached with a given resource. Yes, I mean, that's very important. I would also uh, pose that we consider that the number of resources that a given educator is using of clean is also an important scalable. And the number of students that are reached by educators, individual educators, is also a question of scalability. How scalable are those educators? So with that is a couple things. Um, uh, the, the Girl Scouts are joining the Clean Network and Mobile Climate Science Labs at the event that's behind me in the picture with 300,000 people who come by in a year, in, in a day, each year. 300,000 people see the Clean Network and see work, and now we're being joined with the Girl Scouts of Northern California uh, on a conference that we can mention later on in conferences that go on. Um, on, on the educator, so this is also, these are meant to be announcements. The Bard High School um, for Early College in Southeast DC, I now have the numbers gone over with the professor who's teaching the work on climate change. We're working much with her. She's going to be using the clean resources. She is putting in about 205 hours of dedicated in-class time with students on climate change and climate action. 205 hours. I mean, I think we're often celebrating when we get a teacher for two hours or 10 hours a year. 205 hours with her students in the course of a year. That's pretty damn scalable. And then, um, and, and then also just by the way, Climate Club at Lowell School, where I, you know, now there's two schools that I'm really deeply involved in, we're doubling the amount of time that Climate Club gets per year with, with in school and classes. So that's just a, a couple of things. I hope that's all beneficial because all of these are promoting the clean resources or using them. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jim. Anybody else have announcements? Gina? Um, I'll just mention what I put in the chat. Um, everyone's heard me mention this probably, but the call for proposals for um, Clean's uh, Excel Summit is closing this Friday, the 8th. Um, and just to quickly recap that, we are offering $300 stipend for um, any group that wants to uh, lead a working group this fall and spring. Um, around any topic that they think is pertinent to um, the network and climate education in general. Um, so uh, feel free to submit a description of any working group that you might be interested in leading. You're going to be selecting from the applications up yep. to how many groups? Yep. Um, so uh, reach out with any questions, certainly, but that is uh, closing. How many week. applications have you gotten so far? Uh, we only have one so far, but we have, I think a lot are going to come in um, at the end of the. At the end of the time. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Gina, just, I, th I think do count on, there's going to be some of us who will be right. Yeah. Again, so we're, yeah. we're not, we're not dead. <laughs> and Jen, your hand is up. Sorry. Right. Yeah, yeah. I just had a, I just had a couple of questions. Um, just because I feel slightly out of the loop. I'm sorry. I, I hope that um, this is okay, but That's what so. This is people are gonna I know <laughs> so people are gonna submit they're gonna submit as working groups and then they're gonna be working on stuff and then there's gonna be a later meetup so if you if you're not if you're not in a working group then you're not then you're not there's not like an opportunity to intersect no you can um that's a really good question we're just asking for people to self-select to lead a working group there'll still be opportunities to join a working group later. okay so you can still, once we choose three of them, you'll be, anyone can say like, okay, I'm interested in this topic. I want to join this working group now. Okay. And then is there going to be like a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Katie. 
I was just gonna say, even if you're not in a working group or don't have the time, can't join a working group, they'll be, sorry, my I, voice, I uh, fought a cold this weekend. Um, there'll still be opportunities to join the Excel's Summit events. The, we'll have a kickoff and a coming back together event. Uh, kickoff will be in November and the coming back together, we'll figure out um, a date in the spring for that about six months later. So okay. you'll still be able to participate in the larger events as well, even if you're okay. not in a working group. That's so, what I needed here because we don't have. Go ahead, Kate, Jen. Um, so I was just going to ask if we, um, so if we don't currently have capacity, but we're getting capacity <laughs> later to like be a part of it or like, you know, because we have two new staff that just started today. Woohoo, that's so great. Um, but we, you know, it's, it, it just isn't the right time for us in terms of capacity, but, but in a few months we'll, be ready. I really want them to be able to participate and intersect with clean. So that's what I'm, and, and with this, um, with the ASL, 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 I already said, say it wrong, yeah. but yeah. yeah. So I just want to make sure that we can be participating, even if we're not leading. No, that's a great question. And like Katie said, the kickoff, we're very close to setting a date. The kickoff will be in early November, and then it'll be six months of meeting, probably like once a month, I'm thinking. Um, and then we'll do a wrap up um, and share out in, in the spring sometime. So yeah, there'll be- so you're, saying, so you're saying, as, as Katie suggested, that even if people don't have time to participate in the working group, they could come to the kickoff and to the yeah. wrap up. Yeah, definitely. Even if you're not involved in a working group, even there'll be- We'll open. We'll make those events open to anyone. So okay, that was actually my bigger question. Was like, if you're if you're in, you're in, or or can you like join in whenever kind of thing? Yeah. Okay, yeah. great. And Katie, I envision it being very very fluid like that. So and Katie and Gina, I would take it to you whether you want to encourage this, but I'm gonna give an exam. We're gonna do an example. If you like it, encourage it. If you don't, just stay quiet or say nobody else do this is we're gonna follow like what, what an AGU presentation is like where there's a co there's a lead author, but there might be 10 or more, or 10 is about a good number of co-authors. Co so I've checked with other organizations that I don't think are ready to lead, but we're gonna, when we submit to you by Friday, there'll be a whole bunch of co-authors, the, the organizations that are all coming in. And that's meant to snowball. It's not meant to, to eclipse others and say like, okay, so we're just taking over the session. It's like, come on, let's join in. You're, you're joining 10 other organizations that, that it'll be hint, hint, climate action. Um, <laughs> but if you like that idea, that's a, that's a way to bring people in who aren't, don't want to do the full leading thing. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And the whole thing is designed to be collaborative. It's not, we do not want to be exclusive in any way. The whole purpose is to be as inclusive as possible. So that's the whole reason. If if anyone's had the chance to look at the um, the form yet, you have to submit with at least uh, two people um, on the form. So you, it kind of is forcing you in a way to work with someone else we don't want it to just be one person we want it to be multiple people and I think I I'm not exactly sure because this is so new what the exact outcomes of this will be but certainly I think anyone that's involved in the working group will get mentioned and you know and whatever the outcome is you know so um yeah I totally I think it's going to be we're going to mention as many people and recognize as many people as we can for sure okay thanks um rachel i see you put a, a note in here that you had some announcements also so go ahead i just had a couple of shares so um they're not really announcements but they can wait till the end if we have time if that works well go ahead now it's fine Okay, um, so Jim was talking about the Girl Scouts. Uh, I wanted to share that I am, I was a brownie back in the day and my nieces, which are in second and third grade or second grade actually, um, are um, just joined the brownies and I became a lifetime member of Girl Scouts um, with my background and I'm going to be helped helping their troop 
So I'm kind of excited about that. And I'll nice. be helping with badges and things like that. <laughs> That's wonderful. Um, I wasn't going to share that one, but Jim Jim mentioned Girl Scouts. And I thought, oh my goodness, well, I'm a Girl Scout. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, the second thing was I, I wanted to share. I went on vacation, not this week, but recently. And um, I, I'm an avid snorkeler. I snorkel all over the place, all over the Caribbean. And um, I received an email about this invasion of jellyfish, which is very much climate re uh, change related. And um, indeed, when I was snorkeling in the Bahamas, we were invaded by jellyfish and many folks were getting that were around me were getting stung and we had such trouble. So I have personal experience with this um, jellyfish uh, invasion <laughs> here in the warmer waters. And uh, there's a really good TED Talk video that talks about this and not only, you know, the issue of this jellyfish and why they're invading, but also like solutions, which obviously the best natural solution, if you're familiar with it, is sea turtles. They love to eat them. So anyway, I just, it was a really good video. And if you'd like, I can share the link. Yeah, go and, ahead and put that in the chat. Will do, will do. Um, the third thing I wanted to share is, are you guys familiar with this PragerU um, curriculum that Florida had approved for the state if any teacher or district wants to adopt them? Um, it is not a university at all. It's actually a very conservative group that was led by a businessman and um, they've created these quote unquote educational videos and curriculum um, and they convinced our governor of Florida and uh, lawmakers to approve it as curriculum in our schools and public schools. Well, um, there's definitely a lot of misinformation if you watch any of them. It, it might shock you actually, because it equates people who are advocating for climate change education to Nazis, I'm not kidding. Oh, yeah. um, and uh, I, part of this, I mean, this is bad news, but part of me telling you this is there is some good news to this. A lot of the districts down here are saying, no way are we going to approve this for our district? One of which is one that I'm have a history with, which is Palm Beach County. As you know, as it's, it's like me know, it's the third largest uh, school district in the state and actually the 10th largest school district in the country. Um, um, so it does pull a lot of weight around here in South Florida. And so I was very, very pleased to see Mr. Burke, our superintendent actually make a public statement, um, basically saying we are not going to be sharing this curriculum. So I did email him thanking him for supporting um, science-based, you know, research and such and such. Anyway, so those are my shares. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Rachel. Good to hear about those different things. Jen? I had um, a couple well, one thing really. Um, so we are, it's kind of fun, um, launching a new Southeast Asian Youth Climate Initiative. Um, we uh, were connected um, actually through NAAAE um, with the Ministry of Education in Taiwan, and they invited me to come over and meet with them and be part of this huge youth forum that they're in, that around climate action that they're doing. Um, so, and then we're also meeting with um, a group from Malaysia who's trying to organize a youth climate initiative across Southeast Asia, like linking a number of countries like Cambodia and Thailand and um, Indonesia and Malaysia, uh, predominantly that kind of area of the world. And so with the hopes of um, a larger initiative happening next spring. So, um, so that's sort of an exciting new thing. <laughs> um, I'm not sure exactly how we get into this stuff, but we do. And um, so that, which is really great. And then the other thing, which is exciting, and I kind of mentioned it earlier, is that we um, are expanding our team. So we just um, uh, hired two new staff and we're actually going to hire a third new staff person soon. Um, so now we're going to be from, we went from a team of two to a team of five 
Um, so that's kind of amazing. It doesn't really happen very much where I work that we get to add new positions. Um, so it's really exciting. So thanks. Thanks, Rachel. Congratulations, Jen. That's Gina. fantastic. It's huge. Yeah. We have something along the similar lines. Some of you know that I'm on the board of directors for the Blue Hill Observatory and Science Center. And other than the observers, there's only been two employees the past 20 years. And even with that, we kicked off a new exhibit hall, which opened in July. Um, but um, to, as, of, uh, as of the fifth um, today, we have a director of STEM education. So that's really, really exciting because getting, getting past that mark has been a major struggle. So we're really excited about that. Any other announcements? Okay, why don't we move into um, our conversation today? It's mostly, uh, it's really about all of the various cons uh, conferences that are going to be this fall. So I looked up the dates, locations of these. There's um, uh, the earliest one is ASTC, the Association of Science and Technology Centers. That's going to be in Charlotte, North Carolina from October 10th to the, the 7th to the 10th. Um, and then NAAWE is virtual. Um, and it's uh, there are different parts on different days, but the overarching time frame is October 9th to the 20th. And then NSTA is in Kansas City, Missouri, October 25th to 28th. So these are all back to back to back. And then um, AGU in San Francisco in December, the um, uh, 5th, 11th to 15th. So uh, the idea is sort of to get a sense of where people are going and how people might coordinate or take advantage of, 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 of those conferences. So how many of you are planning to be at NSTA? Nobody. Okay, how about NAAWE? Nobody. ASTC, uh, Rachel, you're going to NAAWE? So it's virtual. It's yes, virtual. it's, it's yeah. virtual, and I do have a grad student that is representing our FAU Pine Dog Environmental Education Center, and she is going to be presenting um, about our uh, an aspect of our climate ready program. Okay, that's great. W what day is it? Is it something that we, we, people might be interested in in logging into? When is it? I think so, actually, and I want to give credit to Clean for some of this, actually. Um, so it's it's a virtual. A recorded session, but hands on. And so we had to get creative on how this is going to work. But it is a 60 minute, it's going to be a 60 minute recorded video. And we use um, online tools in, in some cases to help engage students. Um, one popular one is using Kahoots. And I, I don't, um, I'm, if you're not familiar with Kahoot, let me know. Uh, but they're going to be presenting on how we use Kahoot to help test and uh, student knowledge, but also to help um, them learn. So we we walk through questions and things. And I want to give Clean some credit here, absolutely, because um, in the early days of writing for this grant, we actually used your climate literacy questions. Um, and so those are basically the questions that we're going to be um, utilizing in the Kahoot. Nice. Can I ask a clarifying question? The climate literacy questions, are those the ones from the, the quiz on the website? Oh, cool. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah, and we've been using those for years, actually, the last three years. Um, and I think we might have modified a couple maybe, but in general, it's verbatim, your questions, and, um, and we do credit that. Um, and the and I've asked the students to certainly make sure that they they credit you guys for that as well. That sounds cool. Yeah, that's great. I love that. Um, and yeah, those are those quizzes are out there for people to use. So I really like that use of them. I love hearing that. Thanks for sharing, Rachel. Good Thank luck you. with the presentation. Okay. Is so. Um, I think I already asked. Is anybody going to ASTC? I think I asked that already. Jen, you are. Yeah, I am. Is anybody else here going? Rachel, are you going to Aztec or Colleen? Uh, Don sometimes goes. I am not this year. Okay. 
Let's not, are you doing a are you doing a climate workshop or anything like that? Yeah, we're or? doing um yeah, we're going to run a panel. I'm running a facilitating a panel on climate action in museums like um when I got a really good group so like uh Museum of Science and Discovery in Fort Lauderdale, I like discover mods. Um Science North in in Ontario, uh who else is on that list? I think um I'm freaked now. I'm totally forgetting. Oh, Phipps is uh, Phipps for Pittsburgh is on that list. Um, North Carolina is on the list, and us so five. Um, and then awesome. I'm also I'm also trying to organize a climate pop up, um, which we did last year. We had 18 institutions that participated, plus like tons of other people showed up. It's like a like a networking event, but I haven't I haven't been successful finding the right person at Aztec. But I will post it on the clean network and it's a great place like if you are clean people like we could meet up it's easy to meet up um but i might try to see what i can do to maybe see if folks from clean are going to be there and try to organize something yeah i was gonna say you can always send that uh, list of the email not everybody can join the yeah. calls and i know like yeah i know there's people other people from clean that have gone in the past so yeah yeah thanks katie and jen um what, what is want to make sure uh I'll send you, I'll try to send you a link and things. There, there's a person who's in Aztec who pops up and does things on climate change. I'll, let me get her name. I think it Rose is in her name. Oh yeah. Rose uh, Hendricks. Yeah. So I was just, literally just emailing with them, Good. with her, like literally like an hour ago, because I'm trying to find the right person to do this. Pop -up event. Please bring her in. I mean, I've talked with her and we're doing things. Yeah. We also put a thing out about uh, we're going to do a thing at, at AGU. Anyone wants to join up? And then she didn't submit anything to AGU. So I want to encourage that and do that. I mean, I used to go. Yeah. To, I used to go to AGU conferences a long time ago before they did anything about climate change. And then they did it big and the whole thing, you know, it's been a, an important. I don't know how many science museums show up at. She would have, I don't know how they figure out how, how they do, you know, professional development and stuff. Cause it's expensive to go. It's all these conferences are ridiculous. Like I think, but that's my own personal opinion. They're just expensive. Like if they're you very don't, expensive to go. they're yeah. very expensive, the travel, the hotel, the registration, like I know AG is a little bit different cause you can get a discount, but to get to San Francisco and to stay in San Francisco is really expensive. So. Is AGU, I mean, I, I'm actually, uh, I was going to get to AGU, but is it going to be hybrid? Is it going to be virtual or I think, I think it's is, both. Yeah. It's hybrid. So I think it's hybrid. Whereas I'm pretty sure, um, well, I, AAAS hey. is the other one that I'm involved with. That's not until next February. But that's going to be completely in person. There's not going to be a virtual component. Uh, yeah, I was looking at a lot of these ones that um, Gina put in the chat uh, before the meeting today, and I was finding a lot of them were in person and didn't seem to really have virtual components. NAAW being the opposite of that, they're switching off every year, doing in person and virtual. Um, but it seems like a lot of other places are going back to more in person. I will say AGU is still hybrid this year. They're doing the hybrid version, but it's interesting because they're doing the hybrid oral sessions are completely hybrid like they were last year. But the poster sessions, like last year, there's a separate in-person poster session and a separate virtual poster session. So that's still hybrid. But the virtual poster sessions are apparently going to be in January this year. So they're not going to align with the actual dates of the conference, which is really strange to me. And I don't really understand why they're doing that. It seems like really like, now, I exclusionary. Actually, yeah, I, I, I thought I, it was I, a typo. I couldn't, even, <laughs> I couldn't even really understand. I did submit an abstract to AGU. And um, I actually sent it to Patrick's session. So I had some conversations with him. It, basically, this is integrating climate literacy into higher education. I, I, the, the title, I'm not really, I don't really remember, but that is a context. And I kind of asked about this poster session and whether you indicate um, virtual or in person if you were going to be. And I wasn't actually clear on that at all. So until I actually get my acceptance, when I actually know what kind of presentation I'm going to do, then I'll make a decision about physically going. Um, um, but uh, so, so it, is, who, is anybody else here going to AGU? I mean, I'm going. Yes, okay. 
and I can also uh, verify this because uh, I talk very closely with the Bright Stars, people who read that, who in turn um, uh, have a very close connection with uh, Prashodi. You know, so I mean, they definitely mm -hmm. have the inside track. And this, this is, so it's very real in the way that she came back to us because I was asking, because, you know, we've got 200 students <laughs> doing presentations at, at Bright Stars for AGU. Um, the way they put it is you have, you'll have to make a choice. You can be in, per if you're in person, then you can't be in the January uh, discussions. And indeed, if you're doing it, if you're doing it virtually, it's in January, not during the uh, December thing. You can, however, do your uh, online poster, which I think is the most valuable because that stays up forever. Um, I know. I, I actually send people to my poster from two years ago because it's there and easily available. You know, it's not like carrying a big piece of paper with you. That's right. But you, but they, they're going to make us make a choice. You can either be uh, in person with a paper poster in San Francisco where I live. So easy for me, no flying. Um, or or you have or you you can't or or the virtual you can't do both so but nice. but, but doing the online poster you get to do so that that's happening you get to do that either either you can do the online poster even if you're only in the in-person session that's that's what I, that's what i'm getting now actually not on that i didn't go back and say really 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 because there's sometimes like you don't ask because it's like just go go with yeah that's what you've been saying don't don't give them a chance to say no you don't right I'm, so I'm, I'm just going with the idea of yeah you get to do a poster right so okay i i mean because i think i like the continued access but i also like the being able to talk to people in person and i actually have obviously not been to agu since 2019 december of 2019 so I am <clears throat> really excited about connecting again with everyone. Um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm really, I'm really looking forward to that. My sense is that I think the reason that people, the organizations are going back to fully in person or completely virtual, is organizing an event that's hybrid is ten times more work. It's just I, I'm. I've been involved with um, with AAAS and and last year the um, the meeting was hybrid and um, it's just very very difficult um, and it's 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 you know you're like planning two meetings at the same time so I think that's probably why and it's probably why AGU separated off the virtual poster session because the manpower needed to organize it is just too much to do at the same time. So Rachel, you had a comment. That's where uh, oh, I was just sorry. That's where I, had, I I like the idea. NAAA, I've heard of doing this. And there's one other conference that I've attended before um, for my research and evaluation work that has started doing this as well. The every other year of virtual and mm -hmm. in person, I actually really like that idea because it allows for that accessibility and low tr travel carbon, you know, travel right. and all that every other year. And then the in, you get the in person every other year, and you can kind of choose what you're going to attend. So I just wanted to throw that out there that like I like that idea, and I think it makes sense for places to not try to do both at the same time, but to still allow for both to have Happen. Sorry, Rachel, go ahead. No worries. Um, I guess I have mixed feelings about the whole virtual in person. Uh, I just wanted to share. Um, I remember having a conversation with Frank actually at AGU last year. I was able to attend in person. And um, there's, I mean, there really is something about being there and making personal connections. Um, because I, I just th feel like the in-person, uh, you get more out of it as a presenter and as a participant. Um, you know, I've, I've presented in virtual too, and, you know, there's certainly um, pros and cons, I think, to both. But um, anyway, I just, I, I miss the in-person. I prefer the in-person personally, and maybe that's part of my old-fashioned kind of side of me. <laughs> But there's definitely value in the virtual. So it's interesting. And I was telling, you know, saying earlier, I really thought that AG made a mistake when they said that all virtual like posters were going to be in January. I was really confused by that. Um, but it's it's actually a great experience to walk around and meet people and um, read through the posters and such. So I don't know. We'll see what happens. 
I totally agree, Rachel. That's like, I, I feel so torn. I feel a little bit selfish at times because I'm, I was telling Katie this morning, because I'm remote, I just really appreciate any opportunity to see people in person. But I know, I think a combination of COVID and us, you know, people in this community just never having, being able to get funding and then also concern about carbon emissions with travel it's a really hard thing I feel selfish but like I'm also really excited that things are moving back in person just because I feel like I get so much more out of it but um and I agree the AGU thing is I don't know it's just an interesting well I also know that in if you make it all virtual it's much much better than hybrid I really have a hard time attending extended meetings all virtually I just I just can't my focus is just not there so I really am looking forward to this Um, but the the accessibility issues especially for younger people who don't have the financial wherewithal or the, the the ability to make a decision to go to a professional meeting one of the things that AAAS did. So their meeting is now this year in February is going to be all in person. Um, but one of the things they found was another thing that um, that AAAS does is each of the sections, and I'm secretary of the education sections, I've been very involved with organizing their business meeting and the celebration of their fellows the past few years, is that an in-person section business meeting will attract only those people that are physically there. And maybe we would have 30 people at at this reception that we would put on. Whereas when we had the virtual business meetings, we had 150 people come. And and the numbers are still, the second year, the numbers were on the order of 100. So still significantly higher than the 30 people that could come in. It's only two hours in the evening. I mean, we made it from 7 to 9 p.m., so it accommodates all the time zones pretty much, um, and it's a confined amount of time. So it really, what they ended up doing is that the section meetings, you can have a social gathering of your section at at the in-person meeting, but the business meeting itself is now mandated to be virtual sometime within a month, plus or minus around the meet at the the um, in-person meeting, you should have your business meeting. So that is one lesson they took from the um, from having to be virtual is that a lot of the business meetings are now going to be conducted virtually around the time of the um, annual meeting, but not uh, but not they won't be in person at the annual meeting. So, I thought that that was a good compromise. <laughs> Frank? So one of the things I'm wondering is that if anybody has had any experience with virtual meetings, having an effective networking component, because that has been a real, uh, I mean, UNFCCC actually has their glorious little lobby that, they obviously spent a lot of money developing that never works. I mean, you never make any contact with people. And I think AGU has in the past had networking lounges that. I don't know. Uh, AGU is so big. I feel like it's struggled to do this and they moved to the hybrid model and so didn't invest, like Tamara was saying, if it's all virtual, I think you invest more in some of that network, virtual networking versus when you're hybrid, it's much harder to do. And maybe it's just AGU so big, it, it was always hard for them. But I will say I've done a couple that I thought did a good job of this. The first year of the pandemic, AMS that I attended virtually did a really nice job of having a lot of different networking spaces and um rooms that they set up with specific topics that people could go in had specific, like there was times there's like this is the networking time here's all these different groups you can join and so like that really encouraged people to to actually do that and participate some of it was personal like share your family or your pets on screen and some of it was like let's talk about climate change stuff you know um that was a really well attended one actually um 
And so like, I think if you're really dedicated to this and you make time and space for it, you can do it well. I don't think AGU is one of those places I've seen it done well. I think the numbers um, make a huge... Go ahead, finish. Yeah, I was going to say, the other one I've seen it is in a smaller conference, VSA. They have this like specific networking platform that they have. Like They use Zoom for a lot of the sessions and then for the um, networking, the poster sessions and the networking, they use this thing called spatial chat, which is one of those where you can like move around the room and talk to different people. And they have, you know, a couple of times and spaces where they like, again, host something that's like, you know, here's something we can talk about, but you don't have to, you can split off and do your own thing, you know? So having those like really dedicated and really like um, managed, facilitated networking, I think is the way you have to do it virtually. That's the only way I've seen it work very well. We did, we did that for the Earth Science Information Partners, ESA. Um, when we when they had to have the meetings virtual, they used a platform called Kiko Chat. Um, in which you could, it, it was an excellent networking tool. So you could have rooms for a center so that the way it looked to you on the screen, Frank, is if you were, you could go see which, and you could pop into any room, just like you were in the hall of the conference and going into one room or another room. And you could see all of the slides that were going on, you know, or in all the conversation and any other documents that were shared. Um, and then they had separate, so that, that first year I happened to be president of ESIP, I had a special room so people could come in and talk to me and the executive director. And then they had social times in which it was just like the setting was kind of like a bar and you could go from one place to another. So those are, those are the kinds of tools that, that you can use. Jim, did you have something to add? Sure. And, and, well, it'd be actually running, running with this of, um, the perspective I have of, because in the way I work with most of the students I work with is it's really giving them experience in being adults too, right? I mean, it's it's being, learn, you know, AGU does have an opportunity where they can talk with adults in a big way. So, so examples would be, of, you know, using the best of the each situation. We have now students in many, in seven different states and other countries that are going, that, that are t participating in AGU, but the ones that are in the San Francisco Bay Area are the ones that will go. And so those will be responsible to promote all of them, the ones in Georgia, the ones in Mexico, the ones in India, the ones in, in Washington, D.C. Um, and then the, our students in D.C. are saying, oh, gee, I want to go. A lot of them are kind of wealthy and <laughs> they, they like to fly. And I have to kind of say, you don't want to fly so much because we're going to be in DC next year. So it's going to be on you to do the whole thing. So this is one to encourage. And I just think where I'm saying all this is, is the usual thing is please take advantage of what our young people are doing. We want to promote the clean network. We want to promote your work, Tamara. We want to promote your work, Rachel, your work, Colleen, and Frank, your work and you know what you're doing with the UN and what you do with bringing in us older guys, right? You know, we're, we're not out to pasture. We're, we've, we're great we're working with young people um you know to 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 just bring that in and I, I guess just maybe a preview of what it's going to be like in san francisco at agu we're teaching the students that they can go up to talk to nasa talk to noaa talk to the department of energy in particular they're going to go over to nasa and know and say you know what you've got these satellites which cost a billion dollars each other studying climate change we figured out a way to use them for climate action we're using them for climate action. We're working with other universities and stuff. Do you want to work with us or are you so worried about the con that the Republicans in Congress don't want NOAA to take action on climate change, that you don't want anything to do with it? Well, fine, we will continue to do it anyway. That's a bit of a challenge. This is coming from young people to challenge the federal government agencies. We're using your satellites to take climate action. Are you with us or do you do you want to have nothing to do with it? But do it in a friendly way. We're, we're, we're just helping you out. So that's a little preview. Our young people are not messing around with being serious. So. so anybody else have uh, presentations they're making at a conference in the next few months? Well, I'll let you know about the one that I'm doing at AAAS. So the, well, actually, I, I told you I have an abstract at AGU that has to do with a 
a project in which I integrate business and climate change into their their final their their project, and I can talk to those you about that some other time. But I wanted to talk about the one at AAAS. I was part of a group that organized a, web, a webinar series titled um, Equity and Justice in Science Education. And the organizing group, there were four of us, each of us organized a separate web, webinar. The one I organized was about integrating climate change into higher education for non-STEM majors, those that are not going to be uh, scientists or engineers or technologists, but are going to need to take climate change into account when the decisions they make and whatever career they're going to. And we have, I'm facilitating a panel of three people, one of which is taking, is showing how they ha he had business students interact with Congress to promote climate change legislation. Another is around um, uh, equity in 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 um, areas in which there are toxic environmental conditions and how that's dealt with. And the third one was uh, students communicating about climate change through the arts. So it's it's going to be it's going to be a panel conversation at AAAS. And I would just thought I'd let you know about that. And if that's not until February. So Frank, you had a uh, comment. Frank, you just muted yourself. There we go. <laughs> Asking about um, presentations at conferences. Uh, I will be going to AGU this year. And Eric Cobble and I are doing a poster on um, the uh, on informal science, uh, informal uh, education as a vehicle for encouraging public remote engagement with with the uh, UNF Triple C events. And um, yeah, yeah, we're we're going to be doing that. I also want to do a real quick heads up because uh, Eric and I will be uh, shepherding the call ne next week. And we're going to focus specifically on how clean can be involved with um, encouraging remote engagement, particularly with COP28, which needs all the public grassroots input that we can possibly muster. That's okay. the end of my advertisement. All right, thanks. Um, and so I already had informed Gina that I am going to have to leave now. And so she's going to take over facilitating the call. Thanks for this interesting conversation. And maybe we can find a way, maybe Gina, we can put up a Google spreadsheet and just list the conferences and people can say that, that which ones they're going to so that we can facilitate people connecting. I would appreciate knowing more completely who's going from clean to AGU. Mm, so, thanks a lot. And I am going to sign off now. Thanks, Tamara. Yeah, and I, um, I'll i say we usually create a document that has, I mean, most of you know this already, but we usually make a document that has relevant sessions um, that includes all of the clean sponsored sessions and things that are being hosted sessions that are being hosted by members of the clean community and then also just some other sessions that seem relevant to uh climate ed and energy literacy as well so um we will have that something similar for agu but then also i wanted to say if at any point i know um for anyone listening we're kind of a smaller group at this point now but also for anyone listening to the recording um, everyone is always welcome to feel free to share um, relevant sessions that they might be hosting at any conference on the clean listserv. If you're going to a conference and hosting a session, but you're not sure who's going, you're always welcome to send a message out to the clean listserv and say, hey, I'll be here. Is anyone else going to be here? Um, and just see what kind of response you get. Because we, clean is, um, clean will be at AGU, obviously, but uh, we're not going to be at NAAA this year, which we have been at times in the past in some of the other conferences. So it's really um, part of the reason for this topic today was just to see, you know, it's good to just talk about it and see who's going to be where. Um, but yeah. Um, oh, yeah. And Jim just put in 
Girl Scouts uh, Climate Action Conference in October. There's a lot going on in October. So um, yeah, definitely conference season is upon us. Any other thoughts about this topic? Can I say something about um, Colleen's comment? <laughs> Um, I'm also a huge advocate for ADU, um, Colleen, so I, I highly recommend uh, consider going. I've been a member since I think it was 07 when I joined, and I've been able to participate in things ever since. So um, just one of my, it is actually my favorite meeting, actually, out of all the meetings I've been able to attend. So I hope, I hope to see you there. Go ahead, Colleen. Yeah, I mean, for me, it's just not very directly related to my work. So it would have to be on personal time because my work is so focused on energy in Alaska that while I would certainly get a lot of value out of it, and I think some professional value, it would be hard to justify the cost as a work cost. So then it has to become a personal cost, which is how I did, like I attended some virtual AGU sessions in the past and just paid for it myself. And so it's, it, that's more of my struggle, but it's like, okay, well, it's in San Francisco. So it's a much easier flight for me on the West coast than going somewhere, you know, further East. And so it, it just is like, ah, can, can I make that happen? You know, take the time off basically to do it but it just it does seem really valuable what and so I guess my question for you guys to kind of lead off of that is how do you guys decide what conferences to present at or you know like because there are so many and so I'm kind of curious what other people do how they make those decisions on attending and or presenting at Uh, well, I would maybe maybe tie what I was about to say into with that one, uh, Colleen. I mean, frankly, what what I do and what I encourage our students to do is, where do we think there's actually something going to happen, <laughs> where there is real practical work, where there is real practical collaboration that's going on. You know, it, it, you know, not to be negative about anything, but you know, just something that's going to have some session about climate change, and we're going to just wave our hands and do something, and nothing's going to come of it. We've got better things to do, and we're not going to. We're certainly not going to be burning jet fuel to get there. So, I mean, that would be one with me. And that's one. Th so, in the case of AGU, not only does it happen to be in San Francisco and DC for us, so that's a big factor. I don't know, you know, where other people go. I mean, that's just like, gee, they're, you know, when it's when it's in San Francisco, we're there, right? Any one of them, when they're in San Francisco, it's there. Um, but it's 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 also that they have this component of youth, of young people, of bright stars, which is is enormous which by the way if this is the one i want to mention colleen is me too is agu tends to be we just do science we don't do action we don't do engineering we don't do energy right we're, we're, we 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 watch the planet burn we don't do anything about it i'm for you know if i'm kind of negative that's where it goes but there is a strong component now of taking action in energy and it's through bright stars because if you look at this what the students are submitting is they're taking action at their schools at their university they're doing things and then that tends to push well the adults like well, what are you doing you, you think climate change? maybe one way to say is if you think your work is so important doing research on climate change and you and everyone else is finding out climate change is real and it's serious and doing things and yet you don't do anything to make your satellites more energy efficient or your work more efficient and things you're kind of saying that what your stuff is a bunch of malarkey. I mean, that's a little bit the way I'm kind of encouraging our young people to say, if you believe in what you're doing, be more like Jim Hansen, be more like Carl Sagan, be more like Steven Schneider. You can be a scientist and it doesn't mean you have to do politics, but you're going to show that this stuff really matters. So I think, you know, I get maybe where I'm coming around to it, Colleen, is a presence of your organizations virtually or online, you know, judge the burning of fossil fuels to get there. But it's very important that those of us who are action oriented show up these science oriented things. It's not, oh yeah, you know, climate change is an important academic subject and we don't care what happens to the species on earth. 
that was my soapbox speech sorry <laughs> that's fine that's good I feel um yeah I mean location's a thing for sure I think as you pointed out even in Denver I think it's easier to get to the west coast and east coast in some regards but um or if things come to Denver like last year I couldn't attend the AMS meeting but I was able to go to the boat like a poster session because it was right down in Denver. Jeremiah, my husband, actually attended, um, <clears throat> and we had to kind of one of us had to not attend, so so as to be able to do childcare, pick up and drop off, and things like that. Um, so he attended um, because I did a different conference. I also technically, on a personal level, balance some of my conferences between the climate education work and some of my like research and evaluation work that I do on other projects. Um, so there's like a re there's a visitor studies conference I've gone to a couple of times, and then it's like if I do that, I can't do as many other conferences. Just time and energy, money wise, and things like that. Um, AGU has always been one for the climate education that we like kind of have to attend because it's one of the few places um, that really does that much climate education um, at the conference, and that enough people attend. Um, to make it really worthwhile and cleans always sponsored sessions and sponsored um, events, networking events and things like that. So that's why that's always been a big one for me. And then otherwise it's a lot of like, yeah, if there's other, if there's other um, momentum at conferences uh, for things like climate education. So like, um, I didn't actually attend, but I presented in Jen, <clears throat> I think Jen and Frank put together a workshop, climate education workshop for NAAAE a year or two ago, um, and that they actually did virtually, so I was able to present there. Um, there was an NSTA conference we put together, this big, uh, like, full day clean partners work climate education workshop it was a big effort by a lot of folks and then the pandemic hit and we didn't end up really doing it because they kind of canceled it that year but like that in the past that was a, the way that we would like do conferences we wouldn't do you know we we always send information or send somebody that can talk about clean to NSTA but we don't like have a big presence there every year but like when we can get enough um interest from other folks on the network, we can make that happen. Same with like NAAAE or Aztec. That was another one that I know Jen and Frank put something together for Aztec one year. Um, so I think when there's like enough momentum and there was a year or two, we put sessions in for AMS as well. Um, you know, AMS is meteor, uh, American Meteorological Society, if you don't know, they do a lot of weather and climate work, but um, their education side has been more focused on weather education in the past. And so um, like Wendy Abshire and myself and a couple others um, in this group were trying to push more of the climate education at that conference and did um, a couple of sessions one year. Um, so yeah, I think I think when you can kind of bring it up to clean network folks and get that like momentum or enough participation, that really helps with like why, you know, and it kind of changes from conference to conference every year. But that's a reason that uh, encourage people to go to different conferences if if enough of us are kind of making it worthwhile. Yeah, Rachel. So just a quick from my perspective, and then I have a question. Um, so what interests me with AGU, um, I have a science background. I'm actually an ecologist and biogeochemist by trade. And I studied um, effects of climate change, plant soil interactions, and the post oak savanna of Texas. Um, that was my, my research focus. And so I presented my research at AGU, and that's how I got started. Um, I education section was not on my radar at all, ever. Um, I knew that my uh, uh, advisor, one of my advisors at the time, my mentors, um, her, his wife was a K through 12 educator. And so she got to go, I think it was actually free back then. Um, so I guess my question is, and maybe you guys know this, how long has there been an education section in EGU? I mean, it's great that now I'm in the education world, I can continue to use, you know, my knowledge and connections at EGU. Um, but how long has that been at EGU? I don't know for sure, but it's been a while, but I think it's gained more traction over the last 
couple decades. Like I, I like you came out of science and didn't really know that about ADU until I moved in the education world. Um, so I don't really know how long the section has been there, but I do know it feels like it's gotten bigger or more traction or more of the scientists even know about it over the last like decade or so. I think I started going to this, the education section stuff about 10 years ago myself. And I feel like at first it was very much like it was there, but like separate from the science and the scientists didn't really know about it. And I think it's becoming more of a thing that scientists are even submitting abstracts to education and things like that, you know, so. And, and I, would, I would definitely say that I I think it's it, it's going to continue to be a problem or it's a problem, but we can work on it. We're making progress that there isn't this wall or this, you know, these two silos so that you have most of the people there for science and the others for education, they don't talk to each other. That's why I insist our students are going out and meeting with the scientists and and uh, and and you know people probably see when our students go to the scientists and talk to them about climate change, people start getting in tears with emotional thing of joy of this is really uplifting to have the young people. So having education off away from science is a, you know such an opportunity at AGU. Maybe I should be more positive. If we bring the two the, the two together, it's very wonderful. Yeah, Frank. Yeah, a little historical footnote. Roughly about 90s, early 2000s is when education begins to pick up steam, not only in AGU, but in other organizations like um, uh, Geological Society of America. Before that, it was definitely like teachers here. No, nah, not really. Any other thoughts? On that one too, if AGU briefly tried what AAAS was very good about, if they had a hands-on uh, science event that brought in people, right? A AAAS is now like at about, they've dropped out since COVID, but they would bring in, you know, five to 10,000 people at a convention. It was quite marvelous. AGU tried it, but um, I don't have time to get into why I don't think it was very successful. They didn't follow, fully follow the model of AAAS, but um, just a way of like, and truly bringing the community and making it lively and so on. Um, uh, but that, that was a feature of the education section for a few years at AGO. Well, thanks everyone for a good discussion. It is the top of the hour, so I think we can end it here. Um, but really good hearing all of your thoughts. And I think it's always good to see what people in our community are up to and leading good discussions on. So thank you for putting in the work and being there. And uh, we'll see you next week. That's all. See ya. Bye.